There we go. So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Flog. This is the first talk after the big one, so hey. <laughs> uh, what I would like to talk to you about today is um, a little bit of, uh, so it's a problem which we may not have entirely in the federal community because we are pretty much, uh, we are quite open source oriented. We like uh, making our projects open source and our contributor are used to this, uh, to this period on how do we make project open source, how do we run project open source. But even within communities or companies that are open source friendly, there are always people or situations where people are not feeling like not ready of making the project open source. So one of the questions which I've been wondering is uh, in such an environment which is so friendly to open source projects, why, why are people actually not willing to make the project open source? What are the reasons that they give that they say, well, I can't release this now because of these and these reasons. So I've come up with a list of uh, about 10 reasons. Uh, we, I'm not going to go through them right now because I'm coming back to this. But these are basically a little bit about the, ten reason, the main 10 reasons that I've come up there, that came back the most often. And then there is one, uh, one more reason. That's the 11th. And that one is the, I do not own the code. Well, that's, that one we are going to very quickly talk about it because basically there's not much things we can do about it. If you don't own the code, if you don't own the project that you want to make open source, well then, I'm sorry, but there's not, there's not much I can tell you to, uh, on how to make it open source. Uh, talk to your manager, talk to the person who actually have the code and see with them if you can work something out or just be more careful the next time you start a project that you want to make open source. So back on our 10 reasons. Uh, there are things like, I do not know how. There are, things, there are reasons like it's not worth it. Uh, it's, it's a small project, it's a small idea. It's not, it's not worth publishing. It's, people don't care about it. Anybody can do it in half an hour. Uh, there is no point, so this is, a, this is, this is similar to though it's not worth it, but this is more like uh, there is no point of making it open source because nobody can run it. You need such a specific infrastructure that, yeah, nobody is going to be able to replicate, nobody is going to be able to work on that, so there is no point of making it open source. Uh, it's too much work. I don't want to you know, it's too much work, then you have to do things and, yeah. Uh, there is no documentation, there is no test. There is the, the, the most famous reason is there is I want to clean the code first. Or the, the other one, which is great. I want to do this one more thing, and then I, I release it. It's good enough for production, but not to actually look at the code. Pretty, Pretty much. much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then there is also the, all the question about uh, making a business out of it. So someone will steal my ID. Uh, there is, uh, it's my, what is my business model if I make my project open source? Or there is the question of, uh, it's business critical, so if I release it, then people will, again, steal my ID or work on it. So if we work through them a little bit uh, closer, the first one is, I don't know how. Yes. Next slide. So, well, there are a number of resources available. There are books, there are websites. You can go to conferences. In conferences, you can meet people that are already contributors to open source projects. You can see community managers, and you can meet people from different teams, so like, Red Hat has a team dedicated to helping projects make it being open source and how to build a community around them. So that's the OSAS team within Red Hat. And you can, you can, if you have questions, I'm pretty sure you can contact any of them. We have Remy in the room here, and I'm pretty sure you will be more than happy to answer any questions you could have or any problems you're facing by making your project open source. Uh, but you know, making a project open source, uh, preferably free and open source, starts from the start. The, your project is using, you know, it's, a, it's an application, so there is, a, so course, there is the, the sources. It might be a design project, it might be a book, it might be any, any project. Start from start, make it public. Make this, the source, make what you use to build this project public. It can be as simple as a tarball on, uh, on an FTP server. It can be an HTML page on your personal page. It can be a blog post. Just you know, start from the start. Make the make the code open source, and that's your first step about making your project actually open source. So one of the resources that I was pointing to is the producingoss.com uh, website. Uh, it's a book as well. It's a book which is free in all the meaning of the term. So it's a free book that you can download for free, and it's a free book in the free and open source uh, meaning, so that you can actually improve and work on it. So feel free to to, to mention to visit the page and see if you like it or if there are any things you like in there. The second category of, uh, of points that we got was the it's not worth it, uh, it's 
too specific, nobody will run it, or uh, it's too much work. Well, these are what I call fake reasons. So these are, these are not valid, these are not correct arguments. You can't, you can't refuse to make a project open source using these reasons. And it's very simple. Uh, it's not worth it. Well, the first question is, how do you know? You know, it maybe took you half an hour to work on that, but maybe somebody was struggling on this idea for a couple of days and was trying for the angle to approach that problem. And I have a friend of mine that was like writing a prototype on something, and I was like, you should blog about it. He was like, no, it's not worth it. And I'm like, dude, it's maybe not worth it for you. It's maybe just a prototype. It's maybe just something that you worked on quickly one evening. But I like the idea. I like what you did. And if I had the time and if I was willing to, I might just take on your idea and do something with it. So, and you know, it's just the first step for me to get starting in, in pushing that idea further. But no, he still doesn't publish it, so it's, I'm still uh, angry about him. <laughs> and so yeah, it's not worth it, you do not know. It may be not worth it for you, but it might be worse for someone else. And if you just you know, publish your ID, make a blog post about it, put a simple HTML page somewhere, people can, might actually find it, put a very permissive license on it if you don't care about it. But put it out there. I mean, there is, it won't cost you anything, and it might actually help someone. The second point is, uh, there is no point from an infrastructure point of view. Well, we have a couple of projects in there which are a good example, something like Copper. So to run Copper, you need to have a complete cloud infrastructure because Copper spans a cloud instance when you want to build something. And then we have a bad example, which is Transifex. Transifex used to be open source, and then they moved to a completely closed and proprietary model. And one of the reasons why they moved to, open s to a closed model was like, nobody is running Transifex. So why do we care about making it open source? Because nobody is running it, so what's the point? Well, was the fact that they were making it open source preventing contribution? No, they still had contributor even though they are peop nobody, people were not running Transifex. I've been contributing to Copper and I do not run a cloud instance in my own laptop. So it does, the fact that you need a very specific infrastructure does not mean it that people will not contribute to it. And if you actually invest in things like unit tests, this is actually even easier because then people can contribute to, the, to your project, run the unit test, and if your unit tests are built in such a way that you don't need actually the infrastructure to test the code, then you actually are enabling people to help you to work on, to work on your project, provide features, provide bug reports or bug fixes, and that without actually having this infrastructure problem. So there is no point from infrastructure point of view that's up to you on how you build your project, but you can make an open source project with a very specific infrastructure required. Then the other point is, uh, it's too much work. Well, this is actually not true. This is exactly depending on what you want to do with it. You can make a project open source, free and open source, by just releasing a tarball on an FTP and just leaving it there. You can make a project open source by making a blog post about it with the source code attached to your blog and leaving it there. How far you want to take your project is up to you. It's if you want to build a community around it, if you want to support, to have support, to have tickets, to have mailing lists, to, to report these issues, this is up to you. You can just make your project there, leave it there, people can find it, can contribute, can, or just you know, fork it, and then someone else might step up to actually lead this project inside of you. Which is great, I love when I don't have to work on a project that I started. Anymore. This is the best sign of health for your project. Somebody else, the idea was good enough that somebody else stepped up and took over the project from me. And then we have the, the second categories of, uh, of reasons. These are like, these are the, there is no documentation, there is no test, uh, I want to do this one more thing, or I just, I, I want to rewrite it first. And these are specific to, uh, to one thing, which I, will, I would call hubris. And this is something which in IT world, we have, um, we have a trilling background at that, and that's something which we might want, in, want to work on to improve things. So. The, the hubris aspect, I think, comes from one of the one of the old uh, comes from a whole idea. So this is uh, Larry Wall, Larry Wall, who is the the person who created Perl, and he wrote a blog post saying that there are three virtues that every developer should have: laziness, impatience, and hubris. Laziness because you make the computer do something for you; impatience, you make it so that it's fast; and hubris. So we have the complete definition on the next slide. And it's basically the quality that makes you write and maintain programs that other people won't say anything about. 
Well, this is one way to look at it, and I would like to propose an alternative way, which is the quality that makes you write or create and maintain a well community a welcoming community around your project. So that means that it's not about the project itself, it's not about the code, but it's about the possibility of the project to evolve. It's about the possibility of your project to become better, to have people that improve, that contribute to it and improve it. And there is something uh, about this, which is uh, how we are, the way that we are perceiving IT and project in general. So. There is this well-known saying that says "cogito ergo sum," so that's Latin and that translates to "I think, therefore I am." But in the IT world, we don't. It's not the way we're seeing it. We're seeing "I do, therefore I am." So we are actually people are are the perception that they are being judged not by what they are or who they are, but but what they do. So you're you're a great programmer not because of the way you you met you. You attacked and then you took an angle on a project on how you s you thought about this is a great idea this is a way of solving a problem, but you're you're judged as a developer by how you wrote <coughs> how, how the code looks like, but the code is the technique. What's important is the idea. So and that relates to a to a talk that was given by uh, Kaplan Moss at PyCon this year. Uh, you have the the URL at the bottom is the the YouTube for uh, for his talk, which is available online. If you haven't seen it, it's a great talk. I really encourage you to, to go see it. And what Kaplan was saying is that in the IT world, I don't know if you if you notice, but there are only two kinds of programmers. There are the very very bad programmers and the very very good programmers. So the IT the IT programmers looks a little bit like this. You know, you have the average programmer in the middle here. And then you have the very, very bad programmer on one side and the very, very good programmer on the other side. And there is no average programmer. It's just you're either good or bad. And actually, it's, this is not even realistic. I mean, this is more what it should look like. You have a bunch of very, very bad programmer, and then you have a few very, very good programmer. But you still don't have any average programmer. But we know when you do statistics and when you look into a population of person, we know that talent or skills actually following what we call the normal distribution. And the normal distribution looks like this. You know, it's a bell curve. And that means that most people are actually here. Actually, 95% of the population is, uh, is between the two red lines here. So if we are, if we are uh, I think we are 200, about 200 people in the conference, that means that there are 20 people in the conference that are, of which 10 are very, very good, 10 are very, very bad, and the rest of us are just average. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we have one identified, we have five, nine, <laughs> another nine to five <laughs> to find. But most of us are just average. You know, we have, and this is a perception of what we are and how we do things that we need to change in the IT world. We need to stop thinking that uh, what we do defines us. It's the way we are thinking about it that's important. So you, you have to, we have to realize that we are just as good as the next guy and as bad as the previous one. And you know, one of the ideas that I don't want to publish my code because it's not good enough, because I want to rewrite it, this is, this is, a, wrong w this is a wrong way of doing it. You, know, you need to just open source it and then rewrite it, then, then build a community about it. And you know, people are afraid that if I publish bad code and then a recruiter from you know, Google, Yahoo, Red Hat comes in there, in there and sees the code and is like, this is terrible, I don't want to hire that person. But if you're able to tell the, the, the recruiter, like, yeah, the, this code is bad for these and these reasons, because I took these and these shortcuts, because I didn't know that then, then you actually are able to explain to the recruiter that you have a critical, a self-critical look about your work, that you're able to, sell, to tell, this is bad, and this is how I will improve it, and this is what I want to do with it. Then you actually are able to, to prove that you can think about your work, that you know how to, to solve a problem, and, you, and what's missing is basically the technique. And the techniques is, the programming part is just technical. You can learn that. Writing good code is something you can learn. Having a critical lo look about your work is the important thing. So it's actually maybe a good thing of publishing bad code and having a good uh, open source and LC relation com with the community to improve your project. That's actually a better point than, actually, than directly publishing an amazing code that nobody wants to touch because nobody knows how, to, how it works or to improve it. So this is a little bit of... Uh, all the points which I want. We have to, in the IT world, change the way of uh, perceiving 
what we are, what we do, and start thinking about who we are, as what how we approach something, and not about how we are doing things. Uh, and then we have all the reasons, which are basically running around bus the business side of things. So I don't want to publish my code for all the business reasons. Uh, we can go through them. So the first one is someone steal my ID. Well, that's what licenses is so important in open source project. You know, you can choose license. There are a large number of licenses which co which are allow you allowing you to just choose pick the right one. There is the site, the website uh, tldr legal legal .com where you, for each open source license, and they are, I think, most of them, or all of them are in there, you, for each of them you have the can, cannot, and must of the license. So what you can do with this license, what you cannot do, so most license you cannot be uh, made reliable for the, the, the program, and then you have the must, or so things like you must include a copy of the license with the, with the source code, these kind of things. And using this website, you can actually find the exact license that you need for your project to make sure that People might actually reuse your ID, but they cannot steal it to make business out of it if you don't want to. Then we have the question of uh, what is my, my business model? Well, we need, to re we need to remember that free and open source software, free and open source projects does not mean free beer. It means free source code. It means access to the code. So there are a number of projects that are using open source, pros using open source software, open source tools, and that are just being sold. I mean, uh, Android is open source based. Uh, Real as is selling open source projects. Uh, Emacs was sold at the beginning. Transifex, before it became pr proprietary, also had the business model based on, a pro on an open source project. So don't forget that the, the expertise is in your house, and you can actually also you know, sell the support, sell the teaching. There are a number of uh, business models uh, around the open source uh, software, which are, which, uh, so this is an article from uh, John Kenning, which is called Seven Open Source Business Strategies for Competitive Advantages. And it just goes through all the different, uh, all these seven uh, business models and how you can build using open source project or with an open source project, how you can actually build uh, your business model. The, the link of the article points to the, to the actual article. The link at the bottom points to the And uh, so we have something like uh, the Red Hat, uh, where we, we sell support. Uh, you have something like geo licenses, that's the MySQL model. You have something like uh, advertisements, eventually. Sorry? It's called version. It's a community option. Uh, yeah, you can also have this. You, have, uh, you, have, you can have like a, a proprietary version, which is version n plus one, and then version n is open source, and then we, when you release n plus two, n plus one becomes the open source version. So you have a number of different business models, and this article goes through them all. Then we have uh, the is it business? It is business critical, and then the, the question is: Is all of it business critical, or can you not open source the parts which are not business critical? If you really think that some things re must remain proprietary. Well, can you actually keep these ones and then contribute the, the rest of it? And you know, that will already help to get contribution. Eventually, this might even lower your maintenance burden. If you contribute your changes upstream to open source libraries, then you actually are going to have more people eventually helping you, and therefore you have eventually less work for your developers. So it might actually be a, a good thing at the end. So this was the, the 10 reasons that I found, and this was the thought about which I was having about all of them. And basically, if you have questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. I have a question about the license stuff. You said you can use license for someone from making business out of it, but that's not actually true, right? If I read something as GPL, you can take it and make some business on it as anyone else. So the question is, uh, is the license, is the license actually preventing you from doing business. Uh, it is true, but you have something like the AGPL license for which any modification to the source code must be made public as well. So it means that someone can make business out of your code, but they must make, they must make their change to your code public as well. And therefore, you can, take their, you can also take their change to back to your business. What license is that? AGPL. The you have to make it public. Yeah. Remy, you have? Yeah, which is actually not the case with copyright or permissive licenses where anyone can, you can't stop anyone from making a business out of your code. The only way to make sure that they can be a part
partner and not a competitor if you got the result. I mean, I'm not a lawyer. Technically speaking, you can't stop somebody from making a business out of your proprietary software either. No. Right? There's all kinds of consulting companies. <laughs> law you have to divide between code and the idea that's the first point uh, code is not the idea the idea is something else and making business out of an idea that's that's more a copyright thing you know, it's always uh, prevented uh, it depends a little bit where you live in the world in europe it's always uh, prevented because we, we, we don't have uh, a public domain uh, as us so uh, Beethoven Swift will all be uh, always be uh, better than Swift. So that's an, the idea. Yeah? You can't steal an idea. You can't steal it. It's not possible. It's always your idea. Uh, well. I had a question. Is yeah. secret sauce a myth? Because that's one thing. It's kind of related to the business thing, though. It's mm -hmm. like people will say, well, we don't want to open source this because it's our secret sauce. So something we don't talk about. The question is, uh, is the secret, the secret sauce a, a miss? So we don't want to open source it because this is our very specific business model. Uh, I think this relates to the last point. Uh, this is very critical to our business and we really don't want to open source. Well, what about everything else? Can you, can you make everything else open source? And then, you know, this is the least, I would prefer everything to be, uh, to be open source, of course, but if you really want that part to be, well then, Maybe the earth, maybe the other things can be open source. So sort of a combination of two of your points. Um, also, business is critical. And then too much work. Um, it's we're so busy doing our business critical stuff that we don't actually have time to open source it. Um, what would you say is your response to that? Uh, if you actually want to open source, I've seen projects literally putting a tarball on a on a website. All that the upstream developer was doing was uploading the table of the release. There was no source control. There, wa there was one, but only for himself. So people, that was a little bit, making contribution was well, make a little bit harder because you could, you would send a patch and it would have already changed some things and your patch would of course not apply. Uh, so you can, you can make it open source by just putting a table somewhere. It's, it works, I mean, this is, technically it's valid. Um, yeah. If you want to make it open source, you can make it as simple or as complex as you want. The question is, do you actually want to build the community around it? Then the question is not more is no more about do I want to make my project open source, but do I want to make a community around around it? Do I want to get contribution? Do I want to uh, to get bug fixes uh, and reviews? This kind of thing. Does that answer your question? Yeah. One other comment I, I add to that is that uh, no matter how many smart people you have working inside your organization, there's always Lots more smart people outside, and you can somehow get them to, to, to help you build a community. Help. Even if it is your secret sauce, why not, why not use the smart people on the outside of the organization to help you? Yeah. The, the, the point is, uh, you have all people are small in one area, and you just have to put the person to the right area. That's the point. He m might be a bad programmer, but he's definitely better in writing documentation or something like that. It's all people are small in their own way. Okay. You just have to put them to the right stuff. Yeah, but there, there might be smarter people in that same area outside your company. And you need. And if you can get them to contribute, it's even better. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to ask, um, maybe we'll have a handhold into government enterprise. Um, 
I think this is the one of the places where, as much as I kind of don't like them, pr platform like GitHub are actually providing an answer because they Google Code used to do that a little bit as well. They provide you a way of seeing how LC the, pro the project is. They give you a graphical representation. What what were the last commits? How many people contributed? Are there tickets? How many tickets are booked, are laying around? How many pull requests are are still open and are being reviewed or worked on? So the fact that GitHub makes this uh, contribution model completely open actually helps to determine the, the health of the project. And uh, as a developer, I've been running into many projects that are like, yeah, this looks interesting. And then you look, you have 20 pull requests that none of them have merged. You have 400 tickets and the last commit is five years ago. And you're like, yeah, I might not use that one finally. So there, are also, there are also a number of different kind of things trying to help solve the problem, right? Yeah. For example, Zola, yeah. right? All the like, big chains are focusing on Zola. Um, open, but what's it? Open Hub? Open Hub, right, by Black Duck. Um, but there's other ones as well. And it, personally, I would actually be surprised that we haven't seen a really big rise of um, consulting organizations that help you navigate open source projects. There used to be some, like, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they all kind of died. Um, but it kind of seems like that would be a really useful thing. I actually think it's something that Red Hat should offer as one of our products. I wish you could have a cost. Yeah, yeah. Pretty interesting to you. Yeah, you're first. Something I've noticed is that depending on the environment you're working in, uh, an idea, and I'm not judging this a good idea or a bad idea, if it's held too closely, actually becomes a roadblock to further improvement. Maybe you know, the mindset becomes overprotecting this yeah. idea, right. and the next good idea just doesn't even enter into the thinking process because you're holding this idea. But if you're getting aired out, then it gives room for other ideas into the pipeline. Yeah, that's true. It's actually, uh, there's a, there's been a bunch of writing about the self startup uh, problems, and uh, that basically, if you have an idea for a startup, you are about you know a thousand times better off. If you tell everyone you know, uh, <laughs> and the reason is is because no one, kind of to his point a little bit, no one can really steal your idea. But more importantly, no one actually cares, right? You, ever, you think that you have the best idea in the entire world, and it's going to make a billion dollars and everything else. And for you, it might, but for almost everyone else in the world, it won't. Yeah. So it's kind of like you're much better off talking about this stuff. There's been a bunch of work done around that kind of self start you have something to say? That's good. Right. Okay. I'm just going to say, uh, this, yes, it's great, but I think we talked about ESD in the last half of four weeks, but I think uh, one of the things I don't see is how it's just on is the importance of community in this process. So I've seen a lot of, and there's evidence by the OpenSSL projects issue, whether it's uh, everything from Revolver, people all kinds of statistics, a lot of other products, Bash, Git, uh, very similar, one or two people doing it, and even other projects where you do have multiple contributors, oftentimes it's multiple contributors primarily from one company. So I think a big thing that has to be overcome with this is ensuring that you have a, a, a healthy community around your project. That's why, yes, you published it, and I know a few new companies, have, there will be a few projects that publish their things, but, but it primarily it's all one company running the show. Yeah. And you may have maybe a handful of contributors outside of it. Most most projects are going to be this way anyway. You have the, the main contributors, the people that created the project, and then you have contrib few contributors coming. Most most open open source projects are going to work this way. There are very very few projects like the the Linux kernel where, and even then Red Hat is the one that dominates the number of commits on the on the Linux kernel, but. There are very few projects like the Linux kernel where you have a bunch of companies that are actually invested developer developer time into that project. And Do you also think that I think this is a lot of for us to go back ten years to fifteen years ago? Now we're in a point where open source is not it is actually an industry. Um, and it is so therefore we've got a lot more companies that are driving these projects, etc. But there is a very big difference between a company driven project and a community project and you notice that in the projects, or the companies that drive this company that actually adopt and take on the community approach and share that community roadmap and get people to contribute 
Um, <laughs> I don't remember the exact company name, but Virtuoso. So Virtuoso is a triple store for the semantic web uh, technologies, um, and they have uh, they do have an, an open uh, proprietary and an open source project. And basically, the proprietary project has more features, so supports a larger data set, and is also normally the one basically one version above the the, the open source. Uh, probably do a license. Uh, oh, so it's like To be honest, you get contribution yeah. by the, the, the source code is open and then part of it. So some of the optimizations will be will be not part of the main repository. This makes sense. So I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly which license I use. Uh, it's, it's I, I have a friend's company who, like, I've it's been it's trying to do a long time and open source their stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I think that's the model that they would stick with. Like, you know, it's like, it's a public company, Which Android is using? And also CD uses that. Uh, they are successful companies uh, in yeah. use this model. Yeah, it's more it's not so much the proving the um, the success as much as showing them a model that works and they don't have to figure it out. Own cloud is a good model. Own cloud. a question left? Well then, thank you everyone for coming.